All right, uh, welcome back. If you're just joining us, you're watching Africa's Finance Breakfast Show, New Day on People's Television. My name is Anthony Momodu, and uh, we're still on in the discourse. We just finished talking about uh, the first part of our discourse, which had to do with curbing irregular migration and uh, Rakwe, uh, from Mr. Rakwe from Natip was here to give us uh, some more details. All right, uh, now we know that uh, entire displaced persons are persons who have been forced or obliged to leave their homes due to armed conflicts, violence, or natural disasters. And it's been said that 25 million entirely displaced persons are said to have been uprooted from their homes and trapped within their border in the world after the post -war, Cold War era. And uh, that's why we've decided to look at uh, adopting the national policy on IDPs right here in Nigeria. And then we have a civil society legislative advocacy center program officer in Austin, Arame, in the live studios to help us look into uh, adopting the national policy on IDPs, how feasible it is, and the challenges that it's going to take. Good morning. Nice to have you join us. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Uh, looking at uh, the national policy on IDPs, how strategic and relevant is it to us considering the current situation in Nigeria and on the global scene? Okay, thank you once again. I, I think um, the relevance of such a policy cannot be overemphasized, stemming from the realization that increasingly people are being displaced from their original homes in the country and also are made to flee from either violent conflict or environmentally induced um, conditions. So as of date, we still lack any holistic um, policy framework that seeks to, at its very fundamental base, ensure that those that are affected by either conflict or environmental issues and are made to flee their uh, this, their, their homes are taken care of holistically. So we, we keep on saying that, look, there needs to be such a policy in place. And over and over again, we've been on the advocacy for the adoption of so the, na the draft national policy on internally displaced persons. All right. Uh, well, we know that the managing of IDPs in Nigeria has been said to lack coordination and also have suffered corruption <laughs> and inequality by government uh, agencies and also the non-state actors also. Uh, for you, based on the policy, how do you think the policy, uh, which aspect of the policy can address this anomaly? Yeah, so, so if you look through the draft policy as, as it is, right. it actually provides for a coordination mechanism. It provides um, for some basic form of uh, 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 as procedural issues and institutional arrangements to have in place collaboration and coordination. Uh, you would agree with me that at the heart of any intervention, coordination is key. Okay. So, and that's one of the things that the policy seeks to address in form of having that coordination mechanism, having all other parties on board okay. to ensure that both state actors and non-state actors are actually in sync which responding to forced displacement. So you, you have the technical working group that's all sat together around the table. And mind you, this policy has been on board for a while now. It's, it's been in the pipeline for a while now. It was actually supposed to initially um, last from 2012 okay. to, through 2017. But interestingly, as of 2017, the policy had not been adopted. So we have like a fresh round of intervention seeking to uh, ensure that the, the draft was being reviewed, revised, to conform to present day realities. And again, the second leg of the advocacy to ensure that the Federal Executive Council actually adopts this policy. Okay. Now, when you look at these IDP camps, of course, for every situation, people try to take advantage. So how do you actually know people that actually I, I meant for the IDP camps. In other words, probably things have certain things happen, crisis, violence, and all that, and they're qualified to be in the IDP camps. How, what are the screening you go through? I mean, they go through for you to actually know they really belong to these camps and they're not illegal. They're not trying to take advantage. If, you, if I can say that. Uh, okay. So, uh, in 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 every human situation, it's prone to abuse, and where you you have. Um, very weak institutional arrangements and frameworks, definitely such things will be taken, will be abused. So at the camp stage, you have um, 
the, the, the camp coordination mechanisms to ensure that those, some level of profiling is done to ensure that those that are on camp are actually internally displaced. But however, we, we also have situations and reports that um, there is also some level of diversion even within the camps. We have also had reports of some level of corrupt practices and unethical issues being reported within the camp situation and even in the host communities. So we said that that's why at the very base of our intervention that there should be some form of collaborative arrangement to ensure that even beyond the state actors because that's why the role of civil society is very critical to ensure that there is some form of impetus to the work that government is doing to also serve as some form of um, whistleblowing mechanisms that when there is some form of abuse malfeasance uh, there is also that civil society aspect to strengthen the system and the responses to IDPs because at the heart of it, like we continue to say, whatever and everything that we do is for the betterment of those that have been affected by this conflict. And beyond just this uh, insurgency in the northeast um, part of the country, there are still those that are affected by forced displacement in other aspects of the country. And it brings me back to the point that I mentioned that, look, there has to be some holistic arrangement and framework to ensure that displacement wherever or whenever it occurs, there is some form of response mechanisms to deal with the issue. Okay, you mentioned the word diversion. What do you actually mean? And then secondly, do you have certain agencies, NGOs that are actually working hand in hand with you people to make sure these things, I mean, the IDP camps, at what well, people in the IDP camps are well taken care of and all that, and are they really being consistent in what they're doing by partnering with you? Okay, I, I, when we talk about diversion, and that's why I said that over and over again, you hear reports coming out that there's been diversion of both food and non-food items that are meant for displaced persons. And when these reports come in, sometimes you try to track and follow through these issues. But then again, it comes to the issue of capacity, the capacity to be on the field through and through the processes, the capacity of civil society organizations to be able to track what and what is being released and what and what is being eventually allocated and what gets to these persons of concerns on the camps. And also, more importantly, the capacity of media practitioners to be able to, 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 be able to cover these uh, issues the way they are and also serve as some form of monitoring agency at the camp levels and in the host communities. So this, all of these issues brings back to the issue of coordination, it brings back to the issue of capacity and institutional strengthening, and it brings us to the issue of ensuring that government agencies, when government responds, government should be able to respond as a whole unit and not in silos. And for the part of the civil society organization, whatever we do is just to complement the work of government. Government should be able to act. Government should be able to take responsibility. And whatever civil society organizations like ours do is to ensure that we complement the role of government, both at the camp and host community levels. All right, you made mention of the fact that uh, the draft uh, was supposed to have been implemented, but uh, <laughs> things came into the way. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know what what were those things that came into the way? That's one. Then also, what role has the, the fundamental of national responsibility play in helping us adopt this role? And not forgetting the Kampala uh, convention. Com convention. How key are these two factors? How would they help national responsibility and also the Kampala Convention? How would they help for us to adopt this? And what actually came in between? <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm not government, so I don't speak on behalf of government. But I know you have a clue to <laughs> yeah. what delayed the drop from being implemented since it was a wordy curse. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for us, the, the information at our, our disposal so, remains yeah. that uh, the, the work on the draft policy actually right. commenced way back as 2002 okay and it, there's been series of meetings of what it was constituted as the technical working the group, group. Okay. as the internal uh, for the draft policy and part of that technical working group you have civil society organizations other non-state actors as well as um governments so we we, we are aware that that um, group completed its task sent the initial draft, draft to the okay. then president um good luck jonathan, jonathan yeah 
who sent it back for some inputs. Of course, you know the back and forth that usually yeah. goes through the adoption of policies. Uh, so for some reason, that policy came back for some inputs. It was revised. And uh, like I said, it was originally anticipated that okay. the, the, the initial policy was supposed to be adopted and implemented from 2012 12, yeah. through 2017. Okay. So through that cost of it, because originally it was supposed to last for five years, but we had an interesting situation that for some reasons best known to the uh, 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 actors in play, at play, and powers at play, uh, the, the, president. <laughs> the policy was not adopted through okay. that window. And okay. we, we kept on scaling up our voice to ensure that, look, government has the moral responsibility to ensure because this draft policy as it stands today draws inspiration from the kampala convention mm -hmm. that's the au convention, convention for yeah. the protection and assistance of internally displaced okay. persons so the draft policy is in line is in line with the the provisions of the kampala convention and seeks to give to uh, 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 protection of persons of concern in idps a strict to censor to ensure that they have that kind of framework that takes care of them holistically. And why we do not um, uh, um, push for the, 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 the response to be in some form of regional response. Like I give you an example of what I mean by regional response. You have, for instance, what is known as the Northeast Development Commission, commission yeah. at, the, uh, at the moment. Even if that commission is yet to have kick-started operations fully, However, it's, it's, it's backed by law. It's backed by an act of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But in the real sense of it, when that commission starts to become fully operational, you have a situation whereby it's responding to issues strictly in the northeast East. part of the country. <laughs> However, you will also see re very recently crisis within the north central part of the country, giving rise to a large number of internally displaced persons. As far back as 2012, you had the issues of the flooding that wrecked havoc across the entire country. So how do you begin to respond to all of these displacement issues holistically? That's why we continue to advocate that there should be a form of national response to ensure that wherever internal displacement issues occur, there's some form of framework to kickstart response and ensure that that response is sustained because at the eventually you what you work towards is durable solutions beyond just emergencies you work towards durable solutions for these persons do you think the non implementation of this gives opening for corruption because now you have you still have response being based on state level uh, someone sending um, relief materials and it's been cornered and probably that was what gave the SGF that that loophole for that <laughs> issue that occurred? Uh, it, 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 what it does, really, is even beyond the issue of corruption, like I mentioned, there is a moral body on the government, government to ensure that there is a response framework at the national level in place to take care of those that have been made to flee conflict or environmentally induced displacement. When, when I talk about the moral responsibility, we take, for instance, look, a lot goes into drafting a policy. You have series of meetings, series of um, working sessions, and all of these are being budgeted for and being funded. So all of those resources that go in, it, it doesn't speak too well that those resources are being just thrown to the wind when we do not have an end in sight to all of these efforts that have been in place. On the flip side of the issue of corruption, you've also had reports, you just made reference to the SGF's uh, case, whereby millions, hundreds of millions that would have been uh, heated or allocated yes. to ensuring that pers IDPs have some form of respite uh, and some form of uh, uh, care it was being allocated to cutting of grass. And you want to imagine how much is it to buy the entire tractor you understand? So when these frameworks are in place, yeah, it brings me back to the point that I mentioned about institutional strengthening and capacity Absolutely. development for all of the actors. Because when you then have a policy in place, you then begin to deliberately build capacity of all of the actors at play to be able to do your part. Because everybody is working towards the same goal, or at least I want to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Hamidon. 
Okay. Just, <laughs> just looking at uh, all you've said, uh, c uh, how possible can an action plan and probably trying to use global standards help in uh, pushing for the adoption of the national policy? Oh, oh, can oh. we have pressure <laughs> coming from setting probably United Nations on, or some other agencies that could help us uh, push this? Anthony, Nigeria is a sovereign state. Yes, we, we are. Be beyond the international pressure, we owe it on ourselves to ensure that this but when the government seems not to appreciate that morale. Yes, body. yes. And, and that's why we must scale up. Look, all of the international community and development partners have actually, beyond speaking to uh, the fact that we should have this policy, have been committing resources in terms of technical and financial resources to facilitating the adoption of this policy. So the owner still relies on the federal government to ensure that it walks the talk in ensuring that it adopts this policy. You understand? And of course, because you talk about, so you, sometimes you hear issues filtering into the media space about conflicting roles, conflicting mandates. How do you ensure that all of these things are sorted out to ensure that beyond uh, uh, just having the, the framework in place, everybody abides by his own mandate? So when you have that kind of framework, it ties up everybody's mandates, everybody's responsibility within a coordination framework to respond to this issue. And the issue of the policy also draws inspiration from the UN guiding principle, which of course remains the, the one of the basic United Nations in, international instruments for addressing forced displacement across the globe. It also draws inspiration from the Kampala Convention. So all of these have been made to ensure that at the national level, our response mechanism is in line and conformity with both continental and international best practices. Is there supposed to be like a time frame for national policy to be implemented or anything like that? Because there seems to be a lot of stalling. What are the reasons for some of these unnecessary <laughs> hiccups, really? Because I'll call it unnecessary. Oh, uh, well, well, every policy has like a time frame. Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned that originally the policy was supposed to last from 2012 mm -hmm. through 2017. And of course, when the issues that any policy seeks to or attempts to address are still on ground, then there is always the need for some form of uh, revision or extension of the lifespan. So we, we say that if, as of today, <laughs> the policy is not adopted, some work has gone into reviewing the drafts, as it were. So throughout 2017, under the leadership, the current leadership of the National Commission for Re Refugees, who also midwifed the initial draft, okay. there's been some form of review in processes that has gone into the draft document. Y you've also had inputs that have come in from the six geopolitical zones. And what this has been able to do is to take into context issues that have been, uh, that has developed throughout the period, the window from 2012 to 2017, because the, the issues have evolved. I mean, when that policy was being drafted initially, the issue of the insurgency in the Northeast was not at its peak. So you had to take into context evolving issues in the Northeast. You had to take into context the issue in Cross River, for instance, where tens of thousands of people still remain displaced from the International Court of Justice ruling on the Bakasi situation. Nobody's still talking about those people that have been displaced there. So all of that had to take into consideration in reviewing the initial drafts. All right, and uh, by in 2014, it was said that 8 million IDPs were globally mm -hmm. recorded, yeah. uh, but uh, 1 million was accredited to Nigeria. And also, we, we know that between July to October 2012, we had uh, NEMA report saying 7.7 million Nigerians were affected by flood, uh, why 2.1 million were IDPs, and they had a record of 363 uh, deaths. And uh, we had 18,282 were treated for injuries. Uh, for you, do you think we're going to have more IDPs from natural disasters or armed conflict? Which of them poses? deeper or bigger challenges looking ahead? I, I, I think for me, it, it, it's not about prioritizing 
what form of or what driver of um, displacement should be really uh, uh, looked at? Wouldn't because that help us plug? It, because plug what what hole. it does? What it does? Because you just reeled out statistics, yes. and I can even confirm that between 2013 to 2014, figures that were reeled out by the IDMC International Displacement Monitoring Center pegged it as about 3 million people being displaced. Right. Okay. You understand? So when you reel out such data, these are lives. These are human beings. But when you just see them on the papers, the pages of newspaper, you want to say, okay, uh, these are just numbers. No, they are lives. But however, because of our complexities, because of who we are as a people in this country, we, we, we increasingly see that whenever environmentally induced displacement or cause it doesn't occur in at the space at which violent conflicts tend to drive internal displacement okay. each and every day every other day on the pages of newspaper on the radio on the tv you hear one form of communal conflict one form of um attacks by uh, insurgent groups all of these figures when they are added up, do not actually amount to the number of people that is being... I give you, a, for instance, the issue of the 2012 flooding. Because it was on a high scale, it was across the entire country, you had people that were displaced by that flooding in the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And those, when you put it down to the household level, Households that were affected were also in their tens of thousands. What was the response? You had flooding in Benue in 2017, affecting thousands of households. What was the government's response? So these are the issues that we should be really be trying to seek to address and not just looking at these numbers in, in, in form of a statistical uh, basis. Were, were you impressed with the government's response in 2012 and current, uh, recently what up? happened in Benue State? Uh, uh, be, because of the constituency I represent, where efficiency is prioritized, there is never a time, because of uh, the fact that I'm also a humanitarian worker, I will ever be uh, impressed by what government has done uh, in terms of responding to these issues. Okay. Uh, because I give you an instance, for instance, the, 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 the level of government's response to the flooding in 2012, oh, yeah. you, you had series of allegations that the funds were diverted. You had issues of corruption cases being acute counter accusations and counter allegations. You understand? And when there is doubt in any form of process, in any form of um, response procedure, it then begins to beg the question as to the efficiency of government's response. In 2017 also, the Benue crisis, until the media began to drum up its voice, until the media began to beckon its searchlight on what was happening in Benue State, government's response was a bit like a desical, you understand? Okay. And that's why we talk about civil society's capacity being built in ensuring that they're able to respond to these issues at the very base of uh, uh, the crisis and uh, issues that force causes displacement because the first responders to either conflict or environmental issues are usually these very little civil society and community based organizations at the communal level before you begin to mobilize any SEMA or any NEMA or any refugee agency you understand it is those civil society organizations that initially respond all right, uh, as we wrap up, uh, my final question will be, uh, what, how key is uh, advocacy, um, publicity, how, <laughs> and documentation of the policy, how key are these three factors in you know, pushing for the adoption of the national policy on IDPs? Uh, I, I want to say advocacy is at the heart of the uh, uh, issue for scaling up government's uh, uh, adoption of the draft national policy and when I talk about advocacy it's a it's, it's a broad term that encapsulates all of these components that you highlighted uh, we CISLAC as an institution has been uh, on the path of ensuring that 
government's attention is always on the uh, on this draft policy okay. to make sure that all of our resources all of our efforts do not go down the drain that when this policy is in place it's meant to work for everybody's good and that brings me to the point that i say when government responds it responds for the good of everyone all right, uh, and so uh, what will be your final uh, push for other, uh, probably other non-state actors and stakeholders that you think could actually have a role to play in, in, in pushing this forward? My, my final word would be keep your eye on the ball. We, we must not lose sight of the fact that government owes us a duty to ensure that frameworks are in place for response to not just IDPs, but persons of concerns generally, even at the subnational level, for instance, you look at what is happening in Cross River. Tens of thousands of refugees are being uh, are, are streaming into uh, Nigeria from the Cameroon, the southern Cameroonian yeah. axis. You understand? All of this speaks to our response mechanisms to address holistically the issues of persons of concern. So the point will be for both state and non-state actors to keep their eye on the ball to continue on the path of sustained capacity development for responding to IDPs and persons of concern. For uh, the International uh, Organization for Migration did raise an issue about saying that if the government could uh, bring in the idea of uh, capacity building for areas where we've got conflicts and other issues, that that could be a way to stem migration. And also, as someone who was part of the uh, group that did discussion on the national uh, migration dialogue uh, how how successful would you say the 2017 national migration dialogue was and uh, is there anything better going to be coming out in 2018 because the key question asked was uh, how come despite all the advocacy people still go ahead trying to you know migrate through dangerous routes does it mean the National Migration Dialogue has not been as, as useful as it's supposed to be? Hmm. Now, for what it's called, it's a dialogue. And what it seeks to achieve is to bring all stake uh, stakeholders Congress, on board yeah. for you to come and make your input into the discourse, make recommendations, share experiences. And one thing I can tell you that being a part of the dialogue over time is the fact that uh, the, the, the government needs to ensure that it takes the issue of migration very, very seriously. And when I talk about taking the issues of migration seriously, because even the issue of the IDPs and forced displacement we're talking yeah. about is forced migration. So when you talk about taking the issues of migrations, migration very seriously, it speaks to the fact that government must ensure that what needs to be done is being done in budgetary allocations. Okay. How does government seize, how, how seriously does it take, for instance, the National Commission for Refugees and Migration? Okay. What is the budget line allocated for migratory issues in the country? Beyond just the issue of budgeting, how efficient are this, is this agency enough to, the capacity of the agency to respond to migration issues. And beyond the issue of even budgetary allocation, because migration is a cross-cutting issues, all other uh, uh, partners within the technical working group on migration, how is government's response in building efficiency within those organizations, within those institutions? Because it's a collaborative approach in ensuring that people are made to migrate in a regular fashion because what you cannot stop no matter how you try to do it is migration migration is a normal human human phenomenon and you can never at any point in time stop people from moving so you must have that budgetary allocation first of all to improve institutional uh, 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 funding capacity to also begin to speak to efficiency and speaking to technical capacity of the government agencies to do the work on the ground. So it's a holistic issue. It's a, it, it's a cross-cutting collaboration that requires that even for the beyond just promoting regular migrations, those people that are being brought back, the returnees now, for instance, what 
systems are in place to ensure that some form of uh, 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 trainings, skill acquisition, and long-term sustainability uh, procedural issues are in place. Because I give you an instance. While you are, on one hand, speaking to issues of uh, irregular migration on the okay. Libyan axis, right. on the other hand, you are talking about people dying on the Moroccan axis now. Morocco yeah, the new route, rescue. No. Exactly. It's always been there, Antoine. It's always been there. It's just that these issues have not been brought to the fore and government has not really taken the issues of migrations very seriously because if it has, there would be some increased budgetary allocations for the issue of migration across the country. Assistance, are you convinced the federal government and other stakeholders, uh, including the Swiss government, uh, the European Union that was in attendance during the dialogue, and the International Organization for Migration. Do you think these stakeholders are truly very sincere, especially the EU and the Swiss government, who say, the EU say, yes, they know Nigeria always contribute any country they go because they are skilled, uh, but they are not comfortable with irregular migration. Do you think these countries are 100% truly sincere in helping Nigeria? Why, why I want to say that they are sincere is I, 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 on the reflection that no country will want any group of persons coming into their country to come and be a nuisance of some sort. And those that actually engage in irregular migration actually lack any form of skill and most times are very poorly educated, you understand? I'm not saying that skilled migrants don't go overseas. I'm not saying that because from the, the, the people that have been returning, you have graduates that are yeah. coming back. You have some master's degree holders coming back, you understand? But when you aggregate the number of people that migrate irregularly, okay. they actually lack that form of skill. So it will be in the interest of the European Union and the Swiss government in particular to ensure that even if Nigerians want to migrate, we actually get the best from them to come and contribute meaningfully to our society and economy. Now, I just want to chip in something. It's rather sad that the searchlight has been turned from the government, federal, state, and then it's now been put on trying to put in budget for um, institutions that will sensitize these migrants and all that. How about, because the guest we had earlier said something very key, that rather than stop a hungry child from crying, how about you give the child food so the child will stop crying? Because these people are migrating for certain reasons. Some of them, if you ask me personally, they're good reasons. So how about the government to sit up and stop looting money, stop being corrupt, and just fix the economy for these people to stay back? Because we have to agree that our economy is so messed up, and it's because of these people at the hems of affair, building houses abroad, having hotels abroad. No, it's true, we have to call it spade a spade. You know how about they turn the searchlights on themselves and build the economy? So, so I'll give you an, inst an example that's, while, while we agree, and that's why as an institution, what, what CISLA does is to engage in advocacy for the welfare of the citizens of the country, making inputs to the overall democratic governance to That's ensure. A lot of grammar right there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it very yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because when, when I talk about democratic <laughs> governance, mm -hmm. it's all about institutional strengthening. Government doing what it should do at the heart, both at national mm -hmm. and subnational level. But I, I, what I'm saying is that, look, some of these guys that migrate may not necessarily be poor. You've had reports that suggest that people actually sell their houses. I agree with you. But then, looking <laughs> you at it holistically, we have to go back to the government. We do. If we do. our economy is working, if our way of life in Nigeria has improved, if our security sits up, things will be more... Okay, imagine the killings going on in Benue State they get up and they want to migrate, you can't blame them. Because you have to agree with me that even the um, 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 IG of police has not really done well. There was, um, though it was said that he went to Benin for just a day or two, saw the governor and came back. Went to Nasar for a few days and came back to Abuja. What is going on? So when we look at this holistically, there's a lot of loopholes. 
there, there is a lot of loopholes. And that's why I say we engage at both the national and the subnational level for systems to be in place, for government to do the needful, to be able to cater for its own citizens. Because the truth is that when government puts this necessary uh, environment in place, the enabling environment for businesses to flourish, right. for those that have the requisite educational qualifications to be employed irrespective of where you are from. To you understand? Easily, those, those, those things have a way of reducing the f irregular flow of migrants. You understand? So you, you, have, you then begin to have a system whereby when people migrate, they migrate for legitimate purposes. And when you then start talking about returns, they are bringing, there's some form of framework in place to be able to track these returns to con contribute to national development. We do not excuse anybody for not doing what he or she should be doing, especially as government. You understand? But we say that in as much as government is not doing what it should do. Why would you risk your life going through such risky routes? I, I wouldn't risk my life for anything to go through the Sahara, for instance. Yes. You understand? It's not worth it. <laughs> All right. Uh, on that very strong note, we're going to be kind of a wrap on the discourse. It's not worth the stress. Uh, we've been talking about adopting the national policy on IDPs and uh, the program officer of the uh, Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, uh, talking about CISLAC uh, in the person of Austin Arame, has been in the studios uh, taking us to a uh, very key issue is the fact that uh, the draft was supposed to have been, uh, you know, adopted a long time ago that would have covered 2012 to 2017 uh, but been stored by bureaucracies of government in Nigeria. We're hoping that in 2018 upwards uh, it's going to be looked at and something critically done as soon as possible to save the lives uh, and uh, properties of our IDPs talking about our internally displaced uh, persons. That's how we'll be calling the wrap on today's edition of the program. New Day on People's Television. My name is Anthony Momodu saying thank you very much for joining us on Africa's finest breakfast show uh, from 7.30 to this very moment. And Hemba Dawn <laughs> has the final words. I'm Hemba Dawn Gwande. Thank you so much for staying with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you tomorrow. Good morning. Good morning.